What's up, Launch Streeters? Tamara here, your host, and the person with a full cup of coffee in her hands. Love coffee in the morning. All right. It's the end of yet another year. I don't know about you, but this time of year, I always think to myself, where did the year go? I don't know. It's like every year just flies by. I'm, I'm waiting for that one year where in December I go, wow, that took forever. I can't wait for the next year. <laughs> I doubt that will ever happen. Actually, I am super excited for next year because we have incredible guests on our podcast. We have um, some amazing stuff happening over here at Launch Street, which I can't share yet, but I will in January. It's just exciting. 2019 is going to be amazing, and I hope that it is for you too. But before we get into 2019, we got to close out what was actually an incredible year here at Inside Launch Street as well on 2018. So today's episode is going to be a little bit different. This isn't going to be your typical interview. This is actually going to be a compilation of the best of. So I went back and listened to most of the podcast. And I have to tell you, listening to the sound of my own voice is not fun, but I did it for you. I turned the volume on the low so I didn't have to hear myself too much and I did it. And I pulled out five podcasts that I thought had just a nugget of juicy gold inside of it. Now, don't get me wrong. This was a really hard challenge. I could have picked every interview and every interview, in my opinion, had something pretty awesome to give, some kind of insight or nugget or just perspective on innovation, a tool. They were all really powerful. In fact, here's the little secret. There are several interviews on the chopping block floor because I didn't think they were good enough for you. So every interview that we put out, I think is worth it. Otherwise, it's not happening. I don't care if I spent the time to do the interview. It's not happening if I don't think that I got something that that is important for you to hear or for you to know. So with all of that said, I grabbed five and I pulled out some nuggets so that we could reflect on some of the incredible learning and also just as a reminder to us to do these things as we move forward. Now, here's the thing. I I sound a little bit um, secretive. It's not because I'm trying to be. It's because before every interview section, I actually give a little bit of a preamble of why you're listening to this, who it was, kind of what I took out of it as well. So I'm not going to do that now in this intro. I will do that later. It's a little bit clunky because we're, you know, cutting and chopping in between interviews to kind of pull the most, the most relevant, the most insightful kind of compact gold that we can possibly get you. So bear with that a little bit, but I think you'll get a lot out of it. All right. Enough of me talking about what we're doing. How about we go do it? You've landed Inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. All right, our first up in the best of five compilation is the interview that I did with the Kodiak Cakes founders, Joel Clark and Cameron Smith. Do you remember this one? It was so good. Here's why I pulled this one out. It's full of juicy nuggets. But the one big thing that they talked about that kind of blew my mind was this whole idea of the fact that they look for declining categories as an opportunity to innovate. When they went into the pancake breakfast baking goods category, it was small. It was declining. There were only a few players that kind of hadn't changed anything or the players even hadn't changed in many, many, many years. But in their minds, declining categories are the exact place to innovate. And really for a couple of reasons, as you'll hear them talk about, and I want you to think about how you can apply this to your work and to your world. One is it talked about when you go to a declining category, you could actually bring in new customers to the category. You can bring customers back to the category. So I would take that as instead of fighting for the same customers 
that your competition is fighting for, right? Because then you're all just scrambling for this that little same piece of chum or whatever. Isn't that what they call whale food, right? Or that little kind of like food in the ocean? All right, I digress. But instead of doing that, you're actually capturing new customers and you're bringing them back. The other thing they talked about, I think, is that there's a lack of competition in a declining category. Nobody's going in. So unlike a high growth category where everybody's jumping on the bandwagon and you got to fight even harder to put your stake in the ground, you've got a lack of competition if that category has been declining or even ignored. And the third thing that they just kind of barely mentioned, but I think actually it's super important given how cluttered this world is and how much media and just options we're all inundated with every day, is that it's easier to have meaningful differentiation in that category. Think about it visually for a second as a big bubble, right? And the bubble that you're in only has two or three dots, and you're one of them, versus this bubble over here that has a million dots. In fact, it's busting at the seams. How are you going to differentiate in that? When over here, you have the space to do it, you have the room to do it, and it's easier to get noticed. All right, let's listen to what Joel and Cameron had to say about innovation in declining categories and why that is the way to do it. Why go into a category that was rapidly declining? I mean, and I don't know if that decline is just breakfast foods or kind of pancake waffle mix. So help me understand what was declining, but but it was. So so why why stay there? Most people are jumping ship at that point. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of that was now I think, you know, we look back and we're like, wow, that was that was kind of crazy to go into this category that number one wasn't a growth category. Like you said, it was declining. Buyers would even tell us even back then, yeah, you know, not that many people are making pancakes anymore. It's all about convenience, stuff like that. Um, but we felt like we felt like there was nothing healthy in there. And I, we always have this belief that if we sold something healthy that tasted good, that people would start buying it and they would want to buy it. And the other thing that I think that was that, that we look back and we're like, wow, that was kind of crazy was the pancake category isn't that big. It's actually right. kind of a small category. And so, you know, to launch a whole entire business on a, a category that's not growing, that's not that exciting to buyers and consumers and isn't very big is not a really great prospect. <laughs> the other thing that happened was right after we went on Shark Tank, yeah, like two months. So the show aired in April of 2014. We In June, we actually launched Power Cakes. So that's when Power Cakes went out into Target nationwide. And that's our high protein version. Those are the ones and, I love. Yeah. And, and that just, that resonated with millennials like crazy. And that immediately became the number one pancake uh, mix at Target nationwide, blowing out Aunt Jemima by 20%. So it, it just... It just went crazy. And the other thing that was just so cool about that is it was all incremental growth to the category. So we didn't like take away sales or cannibalize sales from all the other brands. We just added new customers and new growth to that category. And so that was just incredible to see. You know, I think what you just said is so fascinating for listeners out there to to pay attention to that oftentimes I think with – innovation that works like Kodiak, it's not about stealing customers and keeping the pie small, so to speak. It really is about how do we attract new people into the category. And that's ultimately where you win. That, that's You're exactly right. That's what We've kind of found that as a sweet spot almost for us is if the category is kind of declining, that's that in, the, in our minds feels like an opportunity because that means that the category hasn't really seen any real innovation. And that's exactly what we saw in frozen waffles. Frozen waffles had been intriguing to us for a while. And then if you dive a little bit deeper in that category, you see that everything has just pretty much been the same. It's been maybe different flavors, maybe different characters on boxes. But we saw that as, hey, there's no real whole grain, high protein player that still tastes great in this category. And the category is declining. And on top of that, it's also a big category. So we see that as how can we bring people back to this category so that the category can grow incrementally instead of stealing dollars away from someone else, which ends up being really good for the category. And as you're doing that, buyers and retailers get that much more behind your brand because they see that you're filling a void in what they saw was a commoditized category that wasn't growing or going anywhere. Number two in our journey down memory lane in business innovation is my interview with Oren Claff, who is the author of Pitch 
anything. Now, I don't know if you remember this interview, but oh my gosh, we had so much fun. I actually read this book long before his PR people had reached out to us about doing an interview. I was so thrilled when his name came across my desk because this book, Pitch Anything, is all about how do you get buy-in for your ideas. And launch readers, you know that I think there's two sides to this innovation coin. Side one is how do you have more ideas? How do you find innovation? But side two, which is equally important, and frankly, I think where most of us get blocked, where we hit that brick wall, and that's how do we get buy-in from the people that matter so that we can move those ideas forward? We got to sell our ideas. And that doesn't matter if whether we are inside a company and we're selling it to our leadership team, um, whether we're an entrepreneur and we're selling it to our customer, whether we are an intrapreneur inside an organization and we've got to sell it to the front lines to go put it on the shelves or go, you know, if it's a service business, go sell it to their clients. It's all about buy in. And this book changed my perspective on a lot of what I was doing and, and brought up some painful memories of things that I had, pitches, I guess, that I had done wrong when I was trying to sell an innovation project or um, a, you know, a new service to one of my clients. But here's the thing why I, I thought this was so powerful. And, and obviously, we'll put all the links to the books and all the interviews and everything else in the show notes. So you don't have to go digging. I will pull everything out for you and put the links later. But he talks about having to get past the lizard brain, that we're really not that evolved at the end of the day. And the lizard brain is worried about what's the change? What's the danger? Um, he talks about, you know, your brain is looking at it and saying, do I want to eat it? Do I want to mate with it? Or do I want to kill it? And we actually got to get past, past that first to get to those higher functions. And in fact, what he really showed me is that the mistake that I was making, and I think a lot of us make, is we actually kind of try to go to that higher brain function too soon. And that lizard brain on the other side of the table in that person is actually shutting us down, regardless of how brilliant our content is, regardless of how much this solution that you're presenting is going to change the game for the company. Doesn't matter. The lizard brain is shutting you down. And he talks about the thing that gets the attention of the lizard brain is the pain. Most specifically, the change that's coming. Because that's what your lizard brain, if you think way, way back to our primitive days, that's what it's looking for. Change in environment, change in resources, um, the, the threat that's coming at us. So he talked a lot to me about spending time in the pain, in the change before presenting the solution. So whatever it is that you are presenting today for months to come, think about, are you jumping to solution too soon, right? To that higher brain function, instead of sitting in the pain, getting that attention and moving from the lizard brain on up in a way that your brain, their brain can actually comprehend. All right. That all sounds very academic, but it's really not when you listen to the interview. And as I said, this is going to get your attention. And as I'm saying this out loud, what I should have done at the beginning of this is said, if you're not doing this, your job is at risk because nobody's buying your ideas. That's the pain that you're dealing with. Now I got your attention. Now let's talk about the solution, which is pitch anything. Do you see how I did that? Wish I had done that in the beginning. See, it's all a work in progress. How do you know if you're ready? And I know that sounds kind of obvious to some people, maybe those of us who deal with change and thinking differently all the time, but I think there's a lot of people out there who aren't even sure if they're ready or not. So if, if the presenter or the listener? Um, I, well, both, I guess, if there's a perspective for both. Sure, sure. Well, I think about it this way. Uh, maybe 85, 90, 93% of the human mind is dedicated to detecting change. That's why we exist, because we were very, very excellent at three things. Number one, detecting patterns. Number two, focusing immediately on anything in the environment that was changing. And number three, deception, right? That's why humans exist, that's what we're good at. But, uh, but of those, detecting change is what mo and movement is what most of the human mind is dedicated to. So anytime you frame something as changing, it immediately snaps people's attention to you. So it doesn't matter if the listener is ready or not to hear about change. Change immediately makes them pay attention to you. And you as the presenter, right, uh, the way you know you're doing change right is if the stakes are high enough, 
right? Some people present change uh, without enough. So Internet of Things is going to grow from, um, you know, one uh, $50 billion market to $52 billion market in the next two years. Who cares, right? There's no right. stakes, right? When you have change and there's stakes, and the third thing is those stakes are in terms of human dynamics, human experiences, human pain, human loss, then you have the introduction to a presentation. It doesn't matter what it is. So again, it's high stakes, things are changing, and lives are in the balance. And when you have those three things set up, then you have an introduction to a presentation. I don't care what it is. That will work. And if I hear you right and from reading your book, this is not just about – um, not just about trying to raise money, but this is truly anytime you're pitching an idea that needs buy-in from the people that matter. Anytime you need someone to pay attention to you, right? So if you think about it, here's the formula. Attention equals convincing power, right? I think you, me, anybody without thinking about it, if you can get somebody to pay attention to you for half an hour, 45 minutes, two hours, four hours. You could sell anything. There's nothing you couldn't sell if somebody would pay attention to you for four hours, but they won't. And that's the problem, right? How long are they going to pay attention to you? I don't know. You're not a professional presenter. You haven't really organized your subject. You ramble on maybe two minutes, right? You organize your subject. You've, you know, practice it a couple times, maybe five minutes. I'm an expert in this. I practice presentations to the, to, you know, for, for dozens of hours before they go to um, get in front of a buyer, right? And the most I can hold somebody's attention, 15, 18 minutes in a presentation, attention equals convincing power. And so, yes, uh, that, that's the, you know, that's the issue is getting somebody's attention. So there's a couple things in there, Oren, that I wanted to ask you about that I took. I went back before our interview and took copious notes on and looked at what notes I'd taken prior and what I tried to implement and all these places. And one of the things was in the very beginning, you just have this whole thing about this lizard brain versus how we present ideas and how we overcomplicate things. And it got me thinking about a presentation I did once where I thought it was the most – beautiful presentation and high level concepts and like, duh, why aren't they getting it? And I was using SAT words. Like it was amazing. And I got totally shot down. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I understand. Well, there's a couple things, right? First of all, one of the reasons you thought it was amazing is because you were talking, right? And we, as you talk, Obviously. <laughs> fall in love with the sound of your oh, So good. What? Oh, wait a second. Why didn't somebody write that down? Right. Amazing. Has poetry like this ever emanated from another human being on this planet? I mean, Do you hear that violin music? I only. The violin music that you are listening to is actually my voice. The mellifluous, iambic, pentameter, poetic nature of the words coming out of my mouth. This is sing-song material. Somebody bring in a camera crew. This is amazing. <laughs> so, so that's why you thought it was good, right? Because you were talking, yeah. people leave the room, and you thought that's how attention works. But in reality, I think you know, attention works very differently. What a lot of people don't realize is the human mind is not something that exists, right? There's, there's thoughts, there's electrical impulses, there's synapse fine. There's no mind in there, right? So, so if we open up a brain of a rat, a frog, a human being, whatever it is, there's no mind. You can't find it. There's only a brain, all right? There's no soul, right? The soul has never been discovered and the mind has never been discovered. These things have not, along with NLP, been proven out by science. So what is in there is a brain and the brain is something very interesting. Uh, when, when I worked with the cognitive psychology, he said, look, you don't understand the, how the brain works. And, and so, uh, I'm talking about mind and he's talking about brain. Cognitive psychologists care about how information moves through the mind of another human being. And so they explained, look, the brain formed in three distinct phases over a couple million years. The first part of the brain to form in human beings or homo sapiens, you know, we, we were actually homo erectus. And something before that. But the first part of the brain to form was the crocodile brain, the croc brain. And that brain takes in survival information, right? What is this? Something is moving. Something is talking. There is a change going on. I got to pay attention to this. Is this something I should eat? Is this something I should mate with? Is this something I should kill? Got to figure that out very quickly. So no matter what it is, ROI, SaaS software, Internet of Things, um, lo, um, logistics, trucking, going to Mars, 
politics, government, whatever it is, whatever ROI, whatever uh, uh, IRR, whatever thing that you're offering and the benefits you're offering, the, the first part of the brain to get information is the croc brain and it can't understand any of that stuff. It only understands eat, kill, mate with, right? And so your information gets chopped down very, very uh, roughly. So, so unless you start out with stakes, human beings are at risk. Things are changing. There's a lot going on. It doesn't really get through that first part of the brain. So then information goes up, right? Ultimately, you want information to get to what feels like the mind, which is the neocortex. Neocortex processes logic. It's got language. It's got numbers. You understand it. It doesn't have emotions, but uh, it, it understands things and ideas and ROI and return on investment and software and things like that. In order to get information from the croc brain up to the neocortex, it has to pass through the midbrain. So you've got croc brain, midbrain, neocortex, all right? The midbrain understands social situations. So in order to get the information to the part of the brain where you want it to be processed by your customer, by your buyer, by your investor, it has to pass up through the first part, the croc brain, second part, the social brain, which understands are you below somebody or above somebody? And then if that person believes that you are higher status that, that, you know, than them, then the information will move up to the neocortex. There's a lot of work for your information to do before it gets to the part of the brain that can make a decision. And that's why it was frustrating for you because you were going right to the neocortex and you weren't getting access to it. The other parts of the brain were stopping your story, your narrative, your information, your ideas, everything you had from getting through. Number three of the interviews I pulled out was with Magdalena Yessel. Now, I know that our interview was focused on women, but I think we can all agree after listening that this was an interview that everybody can take something away with. Do you remember her delicious F.U. attitude? Love that. Go listen to the interview for that one. I pulled this one out for several reasons. Um, The first one being that this was a very personal interview. And I don't mean personal in the sense of we talked about her kids, her dogs, or anything like that. I mean personal in the sense of this felt like something I could do to elevate my game. It wasn't just about kind of innovation culture or process or, um, you know, other people and interacting with them. It it was really about me and how I and you, how we perceive the work that we do and the game that we're playing. And in fact, speaking of game, I really appreciated what she talked about around focusing it on, on being a game, that we're just in this game and how being wanting to be liked is actually killing our innovation and killing our game. We need to think of it more as how do we play this game? How do we navigate this game to win? And she talked about how when she did that, she played even harder, even better, even stronger, had a more valued voice. So I want us to think about how do we focus on the game? and not focused on being liked, because that's what's hindering our ability to do our work well. And I don't know about you, but I struggle from that too. I know it probably doesn't sound like it, but we all want to be liked, right? Like I, when I do a keynote speeches, I want the audience to laugh because that means they like me. But maybe what I need to be focusing on is not that they're laughing, but that, that they're thinking really hard because I'm pushing them and challenging them because that's really my job. Same for you and your work. Don't worry about being liked. What's the game? Here's the other thing I liked about about that when she talked about it is when you think of it as a game, it's not about like, and nothing's final. It's not personal. It's just about, did this tactic work? Did that play work? What are the players I need to engage? How do I need to come to the playing field tomorrow based on what I learned today? I think that's super cool. The second part that I pulled out that I just absolutely loved was her whole, whole thing about the power of of water. And she had a whole uh, personal ritual that led up to this that um, was so amazing. But the whole point being that water flows and does exactly what it needs to do every single time. It can be powerful and bust through things. It can be still. It can navigate around things. Sometimes it roars. Sometimes it's totally quiet. And how do we apply that in our lives? I will tell you on a personal note, that's something that I really struggle with. I tend to want to roar and be powerful and bust through everything all the time. And I've, in my many years in life, finally, at the ripe age of 46, come to realize that sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is be still 
or navigate around the rocks, the boulders, the obstacles, the power of water and flowing and applying that in our lives. It makes you focus less on being liked and more on getting to play the game. Tell me more about that. What does that mean? Well, if you focus on being liked, in fact, you've given a lot of power to the other side who will either like you or not like you. You basically are defining your self-worth in their terms. But if you more focus on how good you are in playing the game, it's now all on you. It's your own skill set. No one else can define that but you. You work harder. You get better. You've now made yourself a much better player. So as a kid, I realized that oftentimes I was not going to get like I was not going to be liked because I went to a very weird uh, primary school. I went to an all Armenian primary school with a very difficult name. And um, so instead of focusing on having other kids like me, I focused on being so good at playing whatever game we were playing that they would sooner or later want me on their team. So what's one lesson from the book? Maybe the one that um, as you started to really crystallize everything, surprised you or felt really powerful, that, that one thing that you can share with our readers now our readers, our listeners. <laughs> I and readers too, maybe. Yeah. Um, I would love to share the way I open the book and that is the power to flow. Um, I'll tell you the anecdote. Um, in Turkey, where I am from, uh, we have this um, custom and it turns out it's most of the Middle East and the Balkans that do this. When someone is departing on a journey, the whole neighborhood shows up with buckets of water in their hands. And as the person leaves, they throw the buckets of water after them. Um, it is really to symbolize and to tell the departing person, may you flow like water. May you be able to go around the obstacles as you continue your journey. May you find the tr cracks in the rock to flow through. So water symbolizes the ability to move forward towards your goal. And I opened the book with this because I, as I left for the United States when I was 17 years old, my whole family and neighbors showed up with buckets of water in their oh, hands. That's and so it was great. My, my sand off. And what surprises me is that when I wrote this, I felt that a lot of people in the United States were, were shrug off this bizarre custom and would just read on. And the notes that I have received from readers has been amazing how they focus on that imagery. And they say they're now using it to kind of carry themselves through some tough negotiations or some tough situations at work. And I think that unstoppable water, sometimes flowing gently, sometimes roaring, is a great imagery to have when you feel like you've got a big obstacle blocking you. Number four in our list of five is Michael Arena, the chief talent officer at General Motors. I absolutely love it when we get innovators inside big companies onto Launch Street because they really help us see how it's done inside bureaucracies and system and legacy people and thinking. And that's why I pulled this one out because he had some nuggets in here about how to think about the people on your team and who you need to innovate. He talked about social capital and fast movers and people on the fringes. Now, part of the reason I pulled this out is because as he articulates, and you'll hear in this clip, that those people on the fringes are people that we want to leverage because they often have their hands in the outside world too. So they're connecting what's happening inside our companies to kind of the greater world and outside, which means they typically have their hands on innovation. But here's the thing about those people as Michael talked about, they tend to be the ones that grumble. They don't like the systems. They don't like the processes. Everything moves too slow for them. This, by the way, was totally me when I worked for other people. I was such a pain. So what happens? People like that tend to get marginalized inside organizations. And what Michael is saying is, wait a minute, we actually want to leverage those people. We want to find a way to pull them into the fold. We want to we want to use the fact that they're connected to the outside. So instead of marginalizing those people on your team, the people on the fringes, how can we leverage them? 
And you know what? If you're that person on the fringe, you know who you are, right? You've got like one foot in the door, one foot out. I'm not saying you're leaving. I mean that more in terms of mental space, right? You're in the company. You love it. Maybe even love it. But the processes drive you crazy. You want more innovation. You see the things in the outside world that are different and innovative, and you want to pull those in. If that's you, don't wait for someone else to leverage you, by the way. I want you to think about how do I use my voice to bring that innovation in and prove my value and bring those solutions to this group. Um, As you can tell from this interview, why I brought this up in my top five this year is because it really is all about the people and how you tap into the people to drive innovation and ultimately to scale it across. So how do we create an environment that allows us to leverage the people in the center, right? The people that drive the business every day, give them room to innovate, and then leverage the people who are on the fringes as well. I believe Michael talked about fast movers. Those are people who really integrate themselves into the network of your organization super fast, right? It, I think the stat was it takes people three years to get settled into kind of, you know, their their right rhythm in your organization. But Michael talks about finding those fast movers, which are people that do it faster in the center. Now, I know it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, right? In the center and on the fringes, but you got both in your organization, and you need to leverage both to win. So tell me a little bit about social capital. I mean, I think I get it, right? You're, you're really talking about it's not just a hierarchy of, you know, who's above you and below you, but how it all fits together. How do you, I mean, I have this beautiful visual in my head right now, and it's almost organic and moving. H- how do you think of it, and how do you manage that? Yeah, yeah. I think it is organic and moving. That's that's one of the things that makes it uh, so complex. Uh, the you know, I mean, the simple definition of social capital is, you know, who have you established trust with? You know, who are your go-to people and who are the people that you built equity up in those relationships, right? So that's the academic answer. The real the real answer is, you know, and I can do this best by giving you an example, right? You can hire really smart people, you know, and some, and this has happened, right? Where we go out and we look at, you know, the person that went to the best schools, the person that has you know, a breakthrough experience, maybe even a person who started their own business. And we look at them and say, wow, this person's really smart. And then we bring them into an organization and they get rejected. You know, they get pushed to the fringe. And we all know these people. Um, You know, these are the people that have to be sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, the smartest person in the room. And eventually what they know gets marginalized. They get pushed to the edge and, you know, you get the glazed facial right. look over. Nobody cares what they actually people stop know. Listen. People yeah. stop listening. And, you know, that's a wasted asset. Um, so so that's like a real life living example of social capital. You know, I would rather have somebody who's in the, and this is always contextual, but I would rather have somebody who's in the center of that network who knows a little bit less, but can get what they know leveraged and you know, seeded into the network for greater impact. What do you think? I've been so fascinated by what you just said with this whole, like I, you'd rather have someone in the center of that network. Um, and I think launch readers out there listening, think about how you live, live your day at work and kind of how you interact with others. What do you think makes someone good at that? You know, so there are, Rob Cross is a guy who, a researcher who's done a ton of work on organizational networks, the last two decades worth of work. And you know, what he says through, you know, looking at hundreds of different companies, you know, so I'll leverage his research to answer the question. What he says is that, you know, when you step into a large, complex, strong cultured organization, it takes about three years to be assimilated in. Mm. Now, that that number was stunning to me. Yeah. It's like I want people producing three months in, uh, but it takes about three years. But then he went out and studied what he calls fast movers. And fast movers are people that can actually move from the edge to the center of the network, you know, in, you know, as, as little as a third of that time. Um, and, and they went out and looked at the traits of a fast mover. And a fast mover is net net a giver. You know, if you want to borrow Adam Grant's work, net net they're a giver. They're, they're helping other people. They're, you know, it's not about them. It's about the team and the organization. Uh, they're helping other people be better at what they do. And they're they're you know really thinking more holistically than getting themselves known. Mm. That's why sometimes you want people on the fringe of the network. Mm. Um, and here's why. You know, if you're only measuring an internal network, those people that are some of those people that are on the fringe are the ones that are actually connected externally. 
They're the ones that are creating the bridge brokerage ties outside. And what they do, and this, this is the anecdote to being surprised, is they're scouting. They're paying attention to what's happening in the outside world. And what they're doing is discovering. And they're paying you know, considerable attention, not to what you are doing and how you show up with your product lines or services today, but to the future. And, and they're monitoring, and they are, you know, the, you know, sort of the canaries in the coal mine, you know, paying attention to what's happening outside and bringing it back in so that others can, you know, pay attention and listen to them. So what have you found? I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a very different way. I was thinking of the fringe as people who are just not in tune and not connected. But you're mm-hmm. saying they're kind of that, the connection then is what goes to the outside world, so to speak, um, versus the inside. Could be. You know, there are some people that are on the fringe that simply have just been marginalized. And, in yeah. the, you know, every network, I don't want to get too technical, but every network is in the context. So when I'm looking at the context of this function inside General Motors, you know, and I see people on the fringe, I then ask the second question. So they're not connected to this network, but are they connected to another network? And if they are, then I say, great, that's exactly where I want them. If they're not, then they may have just been marginalized and and simply, you know, we have another issue. It's very office space. So take your swing line stapler and go from office to office just to exactly. date myself a little bit. So, <laughs> so here's what I'd love to understand, because I know that we have innovators out there in our community who I would say – are on the fringe, given what you just said, how you defined it, the ones who are, maybe they are connected internally, but more importantly, they're also really in tune externally and paying attention. How do we leverage those people? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but I find that sometimes those people accidentally get marginalized because people don't know how to use them. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, it is, you know, oftentimes what I see is the innovators are the ones screaming most loud inside of organizations about, you know, the bureaucracy and the structure and all these things that are squelching out their brilliant idea. And, you know, it's just stifling them. It's inhibiting them. But there's actually, you know, there's actually been a lot of work done on this topic in regards to, I can talk about external bridges, but you better have some internal bridges as well. Yeah. Um, So if you don't have, if you can't get that information pulled back into the organization, then you don't always have to be the one to do that. You may have one partner um, but there was a great study that was done. It was an academic study where it actually looked at external innovation scouts and a particular organization was investing heavily in it. And what they found out was, yes, you get great discoveries that way, but it was actually the people that also had very rich internal connections that were the greatest innovators. So they, they more is not better, but they always focus on the right relationships. And last, but definitely not least, or whatever that saying is, is Zach First, who is the executive director of the Drucker Institute. Yes, founded by the management guru, Peter Drucker. There's a couple of reasons why I pulled this interview out. It was so fascinating to me. I was falling over laughing, not because he was particularly funny. He was very engaging, but because of some of the things he talked about and how we've been looking at something so wrong. So I'll give you an example and this is part of the clip I pulled out. We in the business world, and tell me if you've heard this, constantly talk about the phrase, well, you can't manage what you can't me- measure, right? Then a little Peter Drucker after that. I've seen that quote, by the way, on company walls. Here's the amazing part. That quote is wrong. That's actually not what Peter Drucker said. I'm going to let Zach tell you, I'm not going to kind of steal the thunder from the interview, but here's what I want you to think about in that quote. You can't manage what you can't measure. Well, you can manage a, a personal relationship, right? You can manage your emotional intelligence. Those are things that you necessarily can't measure. I'm saying that with air quotes, but you can manage. And we get into this whole conversation about how what you manage, however, becomes what you focus on. So the question I have for us and the question that I had coming out of this interview was, am I even managing the right things? Am I measuring the things that are actually going to move the needle forward or not? God, how many, by the way, sayings can I use? I said, last but not least, move the needle forward. I don't even know what move the needle forward means. If somebody, by the way, could email me and tell me where that comes from, I would greatly appreciate it. Do not know. But you know what I'm saying. Are you measuring and managing the right things? And he talks about how if you're measuring the wrong things, 
right? Your tactics, your efforts, all that stuff supporting it is going to head in the wrong direction. So what are you measuring? And that kind of led into a conversation about information obesity, meaning we are overwhelmed with things to measure and information and data. So ultimately what ends up happening is we have too much, that it's a little bit like calories in versus calories out. And we have so much information going in that we can't even get it out. So we don't even know what to look at. So, all right, this last one is all about, are you managing and measuring and what the real quote is? And how do you get on a diet so that you don't have information obesity? I want to go back to the whole numerical thing and the metrics. Um, and I, I love metrics. I love, to, I love to understand where we are. I love to understand where we're headed and progress. One of the things I've experienced and a lot of, I think, the launch streeters out there will tell you is sometimes they over – focus on a lot of different metrics and then they drown in it and they don't necessarily know which metrics to to really focus on the ones that are going to move the needle how do you think about the right metrics to pay attention to versus all the metrics yeah it's a great question um a couple of rules of thumb to start with um one we can go to peter drucker's uh wife of more than 70 years doris who was really a remarkable woman um on, in her own right she was an inventor an entrepreneur a physicist editor of many of his books and a real uh collaborator intellectually with him um doris uh, we knew well she was on our board at the drucker institute for many years she had a phrase she used to use called information obesity yeah and it's a great way to think about you know if we monitored information like calories we'd be a lot more careful about how much mm. of it and what kind of it we consume so that's one just to be aware of the second thing um is my favorite misquotation of Peter Drucker, and there are a lot of them, you find all kinds of things attributed to him uh, just because they sound snappy and kind of wise. And so people assume maybe he said them. Um, there's a wonderful misquotation of his that you can find uh, all over the place, which is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Yeah. I've seen now, it painted on walls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, here's, here's the thing about that. First of all, what he wrote was what gets measured gets managed. Yeah. So the first thing that tells us is let's be both respectful of but also cautious with numbers mm. because if we measure the wrong thing, it's going to be very hard to not manage to that even right. if it's the wrong thing because we measure it. The second thing we know is of course it's not true that you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I mean anyone who has either successfully managed or mismanaged a romantic relationship you knows <laughs> all kinds of stuff that you can't measure is vital. That is true. <laughs> So, so we know that, we, you know, we know that sort of intuitively that's not right. So what we want to think about is let's watch out for information obesity. Don't just vacuum up all the data you can because it'll bog you down. Second, be careful about what you measure because it's going to lead to what you manage. So then that leads us to kind of the third principle, which is make sure that what you're measuring and managing to is directly connected to the results you're trying to achieve. Um, we can look outside business for just an interesting example. I, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago for Harvard Business Review on um, it was called what to measure if you're mission driven. And that's increasingly true for business today. I think they understand the importance of mission. But in this case, it's about a large Episcopal congregation that's here in Los Angeles that was wrestling with the question of whether they should continue to track membership. Um, it's one of the oldest things that churches do yeah. uh, is track membership. But the truth is membership has very little correlation to the financial bottom line, to how much money they raise. And it also has absolutely no correlation to mission because the goal of the church is not to create members. It's to inspire people to go follow the teachings of Jesus. And you don't have to be a member to do that. So you can analogize to your own business and say, well, there are plenty of things we measure that have nothing to do with whatever the relationship is we're trying to establish with our customers. Um, and in that sense, you want to be careful and about what you measure and track. And we are awash to just so many places you can track all manner of metrics. I mean, we can kind of fall into a hole if we're not careful around just the latest, you know, social media dashboard, right? And on and on. What's the actual change you're trying to produce in your customer's life? And how do you best get out that? And the odds are good that the metrics will be a little messy. They'll be a little imperfect. And if they are, that probably tells you you're on the right track. 
because you're trying to measure human beings and they're tricky to measure. Well, that was an absolute blast. And as I said in the beginning, I believe that every interview has a gold nugget in it for you. If I didn't think so, I didn't air it. That's how important I think it is to give you value and give you um, nuggets that can help you move forward and go further faster in your work as innovators inside companies, on small teams, doing your own thing, wherever you are out there. I hope you got tremendous value out of the Inside Launch Street podcast. If you've got time over the holiday break, I highly suggest that you go back and just listen to a few other podcasts too. Maybe the ones I mentioned, maybe other ones that you hadn't gotten to yet. There's so much goodness in there. When people come on our show, they know that I expect them to give us their all, to pull back the curtain, to show us everything they can in an honest and raw way. That's why we barely edit our interviews. As you'll notice, they're conversational. That's why I do the research every single time so that each interview is actually unique. I think the only two questions we ask are the same as in the beginning, the personal question about what would be surprised to learn about you. And at the end, when we ask them, um, kind of what's that one piece of nugget, everything else is about digging and digging and finding that information that's going to be just to those of us listening. That was my explosion sound, by the way, if you weren't sure. It probably sounded like a cough. All right. I hope you had a great year. So looking forward to the next. Tamara, out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.